Hello and welcome to everybody who is joining our final session in this HCD festival for the day. Uh, today we have Juanita Rodriguez who is joining us from Think Action and she'll be discussing with us lessons learned from implementing HCD in the field. So Juanita, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Juanita Rodriguez. I am part of the Think Action team. And for the last um, six months, we've been working together in a team with Breakthrough Action, implementing some projects in with HED around Africa and some others um, in Guyana and Jamaica. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we have been doing uh, for the last in the last year. Um, let me just share my screen and then we can start. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a, a brief overview of uh, the countries where we have been working uh, with human-centered design, um, the kind of uh, health issues and our key priority behaviors that we're targeting with this uh, methodology. And I'm going to talk briefly about the project in Zambia um, and talk to you about the process and some of the lessons learned uh, while doing that project. Juanita, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. It looks like uh, we can't see your slides right now. Oh, I let me see. put it in full presenter mode, it doesn't show up. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry. Is it better now? Um, like oh. that. Yep, now we can see them, thanks. Great, thank you, Heather. Okay, so let's try it like that. Uh, well, first of all, these are some of the countries in which the Think Action and Breakthrough Action team have been working with Human Center Design. We have done some work in Guyana, in Jamaica, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, and Rwanda. We have had for the past um six seven months about over two thousand people involved in our projects and these taking into account are our different target audiences as different subject uh, experts our partners in every country that we work and members of the ministry of health and of course our breakthrough action team some of the our key priority behaviors and some of the things that we have targeted with human center design have been uh, things related with HIV. The, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, the introduction of the HIV self-test. Um, in Zambia, we have been working with uh, increasing the number of HIV tests that especially men are taking, um, MNCH and nutrition, family planning, malaria and ITN use, Zika um, and tuberculosis. And we have also done two human centered design trainings and workshops. This took place in Rwanda and Zambia, and we had different participants from our partners in, in both countries and represented, representatives of the Ministry of Health too. Um, and in these two trainings, I think over 60 people um, came to our workshops and we have had very positive feedback from uh, our participants who have taken human-centered design to their own organizations and more, most importantly have had some kind of transformation in their mindset and their approach to problem solving. So talking about human-centered design, um, as most of you must know, is a process in which we start um, analyzing and empathizing our user or our target audience uh, through the desirability test uh, lens. Um, kind of taking a look of what is desirable and what our user or our target audience is needing at a specific moment. Um, on this first step with human-centered design, we don't um, specifically look into some things that make feasible our solutions or scalable, but we all only take a look at the desirability um, lens. So this is where we start looking with our human-centered design processes. Of course, uh, after proving uh, that our solutions are desirable, then we take uh, some sprints or some more tests about how feasible that solution is and how can the, our teams with our resources uh, can scale them. 
And again, as you know, um, our approach for not only for user testing, but for research is an, an, iterative, an iterative process in which we usually approach it by sprints. So each sprint would mean a more refinement of, of our solutions or our approaches. Many times due to time constraints, we are not able to do as many sprints as we, has, as we have wanted. Uh, but some of the times we have been able to facilitate some more sprints with um, kind of remote support, having our teams in country, just facilitating the, some more testing or some more research uh, with some remote support from the human center design teams. So I wanted to share with you um, our case study for today, which is uh, the project that we have been doing in Zambia. Zambia is a very complex project in which we have six uh, key priority behaviors. The first of them is the use of family planning among adolescents. We have the condom use, especially with uh, risky sex. We have also timely care uh, seeking for children under, under five. Uh, we have the HIV test. Uh, we have complementary feeding for children under two and the ITN use for malaria prevention. So for these key priority behaviors, we first started uh, doing a formative research that took place in four different provinces in Zambia. Um, and for about a month, uh, our teams locally in Zambia were analyzing what, was, what were the main, main uh, problems of our key audiences around these four provinces in Zambia. We developed our own tools uh, in order to be able to recognize what were the main challenges. And after this, we generated insights for each of the key priority behaviors. So Zambia is a special case in which we have a, a lot of complexity since we are targeting six priority behaviors. Usually and most of the times, and most of the other projects we're doing with Breakthrough Action are usually just targeting one key priority behavior. So for example, in Nigeria, we had a, a focus on tuberculosis uh, in November, in which we they were doing already the prototyping and testing phase, um, and many of the other countries are just focusing in one key behavior. So for Zambia, we had to develop insights for each of the priority behavior and also for each of the population that is um, that we are targeting. So we had insights for men, for adolescents, for mothers, and also for um, health providers. So very complex project, but so far we have reached um, amazing results. Uh, right now we are in the scaling, before scaling the, our solutions. So we did for a month um, our research, and after that we generated the insights. We share them with our partners, local partners in Zambia with the Ministry of Health too. And um, we also developed our co-design session after sharing these insights in which we invited also members from our partner organizations, um, members of the Ministry of Health, and representatives of our target populations, target audiences. So we had two uh, co-design sessions in Zambia, um, and around 40 ideas were developed uh, to address these six key priority behaviors. So after these 40 ideas were developed, were in during the workshops, then internally we prioritized the ones that uh, we thought had more potential, the most uh, disruptive ones, and we decided to prototype and test the uh, eight prototypes that had the highest potential um, to, of behavior change. So the, I'm going to share with you also uh, a video that's just like a small introduction of the eight prototypes that we tested in four different provinces, also around Zambia. Let me know if you can listen to it properly. Thank you. 
Okay, so this was a brief uh, video of our four chosen prototypes that we developed in Zambia. I'm now going to explain um, the eight uh, prototypes that we first started testing. Those four that you saw in the video were the chosen ones after we tested these eight that I'm going to uh, share with you. So this first prototype that you are seeing on the screen um, was a prototype in which we wanted to target Banachimbusas which are um, some members of the, of the uh, community, uh, different communities in Zambia that are traditional female counselors, and they do the initiation ceremonies for adults and girls um, in different places in Zambia. So we wanted to give information uh, on sexual and reproductive health to Banachimbusas to see if they were able to influence um, the uptake of family planning of the adults and girls that were going through initiation with them. Uh, we tested this um, in one province in Zambia and we had um, a, a small prototype tested with around 12 uh, Banachimbusas. And we learned a lot about the structure, um, about how they work, about the initiation ceremony as such. Um, and actually for this prototype, we, we wanted to test how open Banachimbusas were um, to to be to talk about family planning during initiation ceremonies, our big su surprise and our positive surprise was that they were actually very open um, about this topic. They were mentioning that it was something that was absolutely necessary. However, they faced uh, a big challenge that was the the approval of the parents of the adolescents that they were, that were they were initiating initiating. So. It was kind of a complex uh, prototype due to the um, fact that we had not only to train the Banachimbusas, but we had some uncertainty in the kind of acceptance and openness from parents related to this issue. So when we went back and analyzed this uh, prototype, it was actually very positive, but it was kind of complex and we, we decided to leave it a bit behind due to the complexity and, the, and how unknown it was it was to know if actually um, parents were going to be able to recommend this to, to their daughters. So we left this prototype behind. We also tested this prototype that was called Ishibenyo Tuntu. It was a special day for adolescent healthcare provision in, in Zambia. Um, and it wa we wanted it to be a day in which uh, adolescents approach the health facility without any any inconvenience without the fear of being judged, without the fear of being seen by elders or members of the family or friends or anything, but we want it to be a comfortable environment for youth. Um, this, especially this prototype was advertised for four days. So we created a very quick radio spot and we hired um, a PA system in the little town in which we were prototyping this, and uh, we also distributed some posters and flyers uh, to, to promote the event. Um, to our surprise, uh, the, <laughs> the 
the the, the method that had the biggest impact was the was the PA system. Um, we learned that well, adolescents from this age are not listening to the radio, so our radio spot was not very successful, um, and the flyers nor the posters uh, were as as successful as we were expecting. So from from this prototype, we had around 40 adolescents coming uh, to the health facility that day. We were, uh, and they were mostly interested in receiving information about family planning and also HIV, which was one of the our purposes to do this kind of event. Um, we had a bit of a challenge with the waiting time that adolescents had um, during this day, because uh, we opened the, the special day at eight in the morning. Um, and we had, as soon as we opened, we had around 30 adolescents waiting to be attended. So this was uh, one of our biggest insights from this prototype that we had to do something with the waiting times. And unfortunately, we had uh, some volunteers um, during this uh, special day in the health facility. So they were able to provide some kind of information uh, for adolescents during this waiting time. Due to the su success of this prototype in this first iteration, we decided to iterate it once again. And we made some changes in the way in which we prototype this based on the uh, lessons learned from the first sprint. So we, on the second time we tested this, we decided not to do uh, any posters or any flyers. And we decided to put all of our efforts in developing a very attractive um, P ad so that people could hear it once uh, the car was going through the town and sharing the message about this uh, special day for adolescents. We changed the location and this uh, on the second time we decided to test it in a facility that was in a more rural setting to see how challenging it would be for adolescents in rural areas to access these kind of services. Um, we also changed um, a bit the approach for the waiting time. So we created games and different activities for adolescents, for adolescents to do while they were waiting. So we, decide, we designed um, a card game. Uh, we, des we designed another game in which we, they were able to write down the questions that they had, put it in a little box, and then a facilitator would answer those questions. And it would be that nobody would know the question, from who would the question be? coming from. So we tested this for a second time. And this was, again, a very successful prototype where over 40 adolescents came. Uh, girls who were coming were most of them interested in accessing family planning methods. And guys, uh, they wanted to get condoms and also the HIV test. So fantastic prototype. And this is one of the chosen ones uh, from the team in Breakthrough Action and the one one that we are putting a lot of effort in, in scaling around Zambia. This next prototype is very similar to the one that I just mentioned. The difference is that for these, we're targeting men. Uh, and so this prototype is called the Men's Wellness Day. Um, for the first sprint, we also had a very similar approach. We created a radio spot, we distributed posters, flyers, and we had a PA system going around uh, town for four days. So this Men's Wellness Day took, day took place on a Friday, this first one, and also we had a uh, very positive participation from men. Um, on this first sprint, we also learned that, well, radio was a good way in which men heard about the Men's Wellness Day and also the PA system. Uh, men were also especially interested in getting to know about, a, well, generally their health. But for this first sprint, we had the, the surprise that we had especially elder men approaching the health facility. So um, if I remember correctly, the mean age of the men coming to this first men, Men's Wellness Day was around 57 years old. And we actually wanted to target men who were a bit younger. So the men that were coming were coming to just to check on pre-existing conditions. Some wanted to check their eyes, their sugar levels. Um, but we understood from this first print 
that we actually wanted to change a bit the focus and target younger men. So for the second sprint, because we decided to iterate on this on this prototype due to the success that we had, we decided to change a couple of, of things. One of them was to create a PA, a, like a, an advertisement that was specially targeting young men from 35 to 50 years old. Um, we also decided to do something uh, very innovative with the waiting time with this Men's Wellness Day. So we also had a bit of a problem with the waiting time on the, on the first print uh, of this Men's Wellness Day. So for the, and we actually received this recommendation from these men who you, you can see in the picture. While they were waiting, we approached them and um, we started to talk to them and to figure out what um, they could think about to make this uh, kind of services much better. Uh, they were okay about the waiting time for their for them, the time was not a big, big concern, but for some others it was because they had to go uh, back to work or they asked for permission in their work, in their jobs to come to the wellness day. So what they suggested was to have an appointment system, an appointment mechanism in which they could sign up previously either in the health facility or with the, their community leader um, for, a, for an appointment uh, for this men's wellness day and this was where we decided to test on the on the second sprint we distributed um, a set of spreadsheets for uh, the community leaders and also in the health facility and we had a 20 minute 20 or 30 minutes uh, appointment so men um, only had to go to the health facility write down their names and then on the day of the wellness day they would just approach the health facility at the time of their appointment. So on the second sprint, we tested this, and again, the results were very positive, um, not only from the patient uh, or client point of view, but also from the health provider. Of course, they had a bit more pressure due to the time constraints of the, of the appointment, but it was much more helpful and uh, much more effective to attend and to have all the checkups for all the people who were coming to the health facility. So this is also another prototype that we are scaling in Zambia and we are also developing and moving forward with this one. This fourth prototype are um, the growth monitoring chart. Uh, for the first prototype, we tested it in a rural and urban context. And the idea of this chart is, is to be an, an aid in the household so that families in their own house can track the growth of the children as i said at home so that they of course would go to the health facility to the regular checkups but they could also monitor the growth at home so it's a very simple chart in which as you can see you have just three colors the red yellow and green um, and it's especially well made for children uh, under two years old and the idea is that uh, parents are measuring their children every three months. So the vertical lines that you can see here in the chart are showing each of the, the different ages in which children should be measured uh, before they're, they are two years old. So we tested this and for the first sprint, um, actually this is the picture of the second sprint, but for the first sprint we had a very, very basic prototype was made of paper, was uh, colored with markers in which we had only the um, different sections colored um, to see what was the understanding of families, if it was too complex to understand or if it was okay for them and if it, they could also see the value of the chart. Uh, something that we also decided to test was not to have any kind of a uh, measurement. So as you can see, you cannot well, you can't see uh, if that's uh, 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters, but we decided to test if with, the, with only the colors, um, our users and families were just going to be able to recognize um, if, if their children were growing appropriately. So if, if a child was, uh, let's say, in the red zone, then that would be, mean a danger zone. So over here in the chart, we also printed 
or had some recommendations on what kind of food to give to their children so that they could grow better. And of course, they should go to a health facility to just understand uh, what was going on and if health-wise their children were okay. So for this first prototype, uh, the reception was also very positive. Uh, our users were able to understand the chart uh, without any, any complication. And in Zambia, we faced a lot of challenges uh, related to um, uh, illiteracy. So that was why we had a printed guy, guide that was uh, trying to explain what the chart was doing. Uh, but for most of the users, it was very easy to understand and to use. So as I said, on the first print, we had a paper prototype. And for the second sprint, we decided to iterate and to refine the idea uh, a bit more. That's why uh, we decided to iterate also in the kind of material that in which the chart was printed. And this was a huge innovation. It's very unique for this chart. Um, and it's a chart printed in Chitenge material, which is a material similar to the one that the lady is wearing as a skirt in the picture and is usually something that women use to carry their children or the, a material that they also use to cover their legs. Um, and specifically, the, the purpose of this Chitenge as a growth monitoring chart is also to be flexible enough so that also children that are not able to stand um, are also able to be measured. So uh, parents would, also, would only place the chart all over the floor and then they could just uh, see if their children were in a red, yellow, or green zone. So this is also a prototype that we are uh, moving forward with in Zambia. We are um, yeah, implementing this one too. This fifth prototype uh, was related to the ITN use in Zambia. And we wanted to create some commitments and reminders through SMS and IVR. So we had a bit of a challenge uh, here, uh, not because of the idea as such, but when we were testing this idea, then we understood that some of the distribution of the ITN um, were kind of the challenges for this uh, idea. So we had uh, five adolescents signing in to receive the commitment uh, not to sign the commitment and to receive the reminder of their SMS. And the kind of reminder that we were proposing were kind of things like, um, remember to put down your ITN tonight. Uh, so to receive that uh, every day, a uh, reminder is on the impacts of uh, getting malaria and the positive impacts of just taking care of their families and using the ITN. So five adolescents uh, signing to receive these kind of reminders in their cell phones. Uh, we had five women and five men also signing in for this. So as soon as uh, we finished talking to the adolescents who decided to sign in to receive these reminders, they mentioned that they didn't have an ITN. So we talked to the Ministry of Health people who were uh, coming together to test these prototypes. And we, they actually mentioned that, well, distribution was a bit of a challenge around Zambia, because right now the target and ITNs are only being distributed to pregnant women um, and, and to mothers of children under five. So if an adolescent wanted to get an ITN at that moment, it would be a bit, a bit of a challenge. So we realized that even if we did this ITN commitment and these reminders, there was a challenge related to the distribution of the ITN that for us needed to be solved and it was a priority before implementing um, a prototype or a solution like this one. So we decided to push back on this ITN commitment and reminder solution. Um, we had another solution for the ITN use, which was related to identifying community champions in different communities uh, for the ITN use. So we trained um, a group of adolescents, a group of women, and also a group of men um, that were uh, community leaders. Uh, and we wanted to identify if they were able to influence 
people in their community and to motivate the use of ITN um, every day, like on a, on a daily basis. Uh, we also train them on how to hang their nets appropriately. Um, and for five days, we gave them the mission to identify uh, two families in their communities, one of them uh, that didn't have a net and another one that had a net um, to see if they could manage and to, to understand if they were using the net appropriately um, or if they uh, wanted to receive any kind of recommendation on how to hang their net. And for the family that didn't have a net, they would give them an ITN and they would teach them how to hang their net appropriately. So it was also a prototype that in which the complexity was very hard because we had a lot of variables influence, a lot of people, community members um, involved in this. Um, and it was a positive uh, prototype. However, again, due to the complexity and the kind of resources that we were having in the project, uh, we decided to push back on this one too. The seventh prototype is called Nizi, with which if I, and yeah, if I remember correctly, Nizi in Bemba or means like, shh, like stay quiet. So this was a non-disclosure agreement that was supposed to be signed from a, by the health provider. So it would be a promise to themselves not to disclose any kind of information that the, that the patient was sharing with, with them. Um, so this was, its main purpose was to enhance confidentiality uh, when it was about sharing personal information during the visit to a health facility. So the, this yellow agreement that you can see in the picture was the one the health provider um, had to sign and also show in the consultation room so that they, the patient, as soon as they arrived to the consultation room, they could see it and then the provider would explain what it would be what it was about. And we also prototype another promise that was supposed to be done between the patient and the health provider, some kind of promise in which both of them had commitments. So the health provider promised not to disclose any kind of information, but the patient was also supposed to promise um, that they would follow their advice, that they would be honest about their pre-existing conditions and so on. This was um, a successful prototype. Uh, we figured out for this first sprint that we had to change some things in the in the way that we that this prototype was working. For example, um, as many of you should know, most of the health facilities um, have a lot of posters um, and things that are polluting the the visual range of people as soon as they arrive to a consultation room. So one of the challenges was that people were, or clients were not seeing the poster when they went into the consultation room. So we decided to make a little twist on that, um, to move away a bit of the poster. And we are actually creating some badges, some wristbands and some other symbols that health providers can use so that people are able to recognize that they are a confidential doctor, a confidential nurse, or a confidential health provider. So for the second iteration, we tested um, the solution as I am as I am saying with a little tweaks um, on on the way that these promises were being displayed and the way in which the promises were being done between the client and the provider. So this is also um, another prototype that we are scaling and moving forward with in Zambia. And the Healthy Family Branded Campaign is um, a campaign that's covering the four prototypes that we have chosen to uh, move forward with. And we are designing a, a concept in which we can, that can cover overall, all the prototypes and that can suggest uh, our users and our target audiences in Zambia, uh, what health, what being a healthy family is about. Uh, this is the main purpose is to encourage Ma male's involvement in the children's health uh, and to increase parent-child communication in the country. So these were the eight prototypes that we tested in the first sprint in Zambia. Um, as I mentioned, we were able to do a second sprint in which we tested the four prototypes that were the most successful ones. And those are the ones that we are moving forward with uh, for the scaling part.
Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the lessons, um, not only from this project, but also from other projects of my colleagues uh, from Think Action in other countries. Um, so four things that have worked very well and three challenges that we have we have faced and that we think that we can do much much better so what has worked well um, for me this is the start and is having a, a beginner's mind this is something that we have also been very pushy about in in our human center design workshops and is to take take away that hat of I'm an expert, of I know everything, I know how this works, um, to shift, shifting that into making people approach the problem as a kid and approach the problem ignoring what they think that they know about the challenge. Um, so this has worked uh, very well. Of course, this is a whole process and it's it hasn't been easy, but I would say that most of our partners and even our users are very very open to creating things with open eyes with new eyes and removing and understanding some of the assumptions that we have of our challenges and of course being open to new approaches uh, such as human centered design so this has something that i think that has been working uh, very well in our projects and in in our human centered design workshops also uh, my second a point would be um, having an open and creative thinking um, and, and of course not judging other people's point of view other people's ideas and this is um, especially when we are in our idea generation workshops um, it's a very dynamic environment or our inside generation workshops in which we have people from different backgrounds we have different uh, people coming from different places of the country and again being able to think to think openly to create uh, solutions that are creative or solutions that not necessarily are creative but that can work and that can solve the issue that we're targeting has been also very 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 good my third point um, is also learning to embrace failure um, some of our biggest lessons when we prototype and when we test and also when we're doing uh, research is that sometimes our approaches uh, can work and sometimes our approaches might not work as, as good as we have thought about. Thought. So um, especially embracing failure and learning from our mistakes has, has been something that we um, have motivated a lot in not only to happen not only internally in breakthrough action but also in all the kind of work that we're doing with our partners in country so even though for example in the in my example of my of the eight prototypes we knew that some of them didn't work uh, some of them work but for those that didn't work we learned a lot from those things that didn't work so why didn't it work what could the things um what could we do in order to make this prototype better so again as, as it says in the in the slide i think failure builds and failure can teach you a lot a lot of things so embracing failure and seeing the positive things uh, on the mistakes and on failures and errors um, has been something that we have been doing again very good around the different projects that we have been doing with human center design around the world um fourth one um, also is the partners involvement um which is something that's that's sometimes uh, a bit of a challenge uh, because we're not only working with our time commitment but also from the commitment of of our partners and again i think the involvement from them and the openness from partners to not only learn from human centered design but to uh, apply the lessons learned from human centered design in their different projects and in their different organizations has been also fantastic and it has helped us a lot uh, in all of the stages in human center design in the research uh, in the ideation in the prototyping and also in the testing and some of the challenges that we have faced are well 
three of them. The first one is time. Um, and as you might know, well, human-centered design is iterative by nature. If you remember this slide that I shared with you, um, we usually suggest that human-centered design takes a bit of time to analyze appropriately what, what's the actual challenge that our audience is facing, to be able to empathize correctly, to be able to understand what are all the different problematics related to that specific challenge that we're solving and to analyze different stakeholders related to that challenge also. And this is only from the research perspective, but when it comes to prototyping and testing, um, many, many times in our projects, we're only being able to make one sprint, uh, meaning that we do only one iteration of the prototypes that we um, think that could have the biggest potential. But then with human-centered design, it should be an iterative process. So every time you iterate, you would refine your prototypes until you get into a solution that is the one that you are going to be scaling. Um, so usually we face a, a time constraint, which doesn't allow us to make as many design sprints as we, as we suggest or as it could be better, best for the, for the project and for the process. So time has not always been in our side. The second part um, about a bit of a challenge has been to tolerate ambigu ambiguity um, from the teams, from the different partners, from the users. And this is, of course, not easy. From human nature, we always want to have a solution. We always want to have an answer. And with a human-centered design, some of the things that we suggest is also to tolerate uh, not knowing to tolerate not knowing what the solution will be, to tolerate um, just exploring and just seeing uh, what, what could happen with the process. And spending a lot of time just asking questions and kind of resisting the urge to move to feasible solutions, uh, or to what can work, to what we can do, and kind of not moving until the feasibility and scalability lenses uh, before we have only analyzed the desirability. So many times I think we, we kind of block some ideas that have a lot of potential because we think that we don't have the, the power to scale them or we don't have the, the networks to distribute it. Uh, and this sometimes, uh, I'm not saying is blocking us, but uh, if we decided to tolerate ambiguity uh, a bit better then we could explore um, much more on things that have potential, uh, but have never been trying due to the fact that we are just thinking about what's feasible and what we can actually make make happen. Um, and my third point from challenges faced is a um, question mark and is how, how do we scale solutions? And it's a question mark um, that we face as soon as we finish the prototyping phase, uh, the prototyping and testing phases in which, okay, we have, for example, our eight prototypes that we knew that worked, that had uh, some kind of success. And then we chose four that were the most successful ones. And now what? Now what happens? Now what do we do in order to be able to distribute uh, the charts, uh, in order to be able to have uh, six men, six men's wellness day uh, happening in Zambia on the same day. So this is a question mark that we have been trying to, to understand, to, um, to think what, what we could do better in order to be able to scale our solutions appropriately, effectively, and in time. Um, so this, has, this was a bit of an overview of kind of the challenges that we have faced with human-centered design, some things that we have done right that are working and some other things that we could still work on. Um, and again, I hope you have enjoyed the time looking at the project in Zambia. There have been a lot of other projects taking place, as I mentioned, in other countries, and my colleagues would be 
able to talk about uh, the, about these projects much better than I can. Uh, but it was my pleasure to have you all uh, here today. And now I'm open to questions. If any of you uh, have any questions about the process in Zambia and about the challenges that we have faced uh, with human centered design, uh, now it's open to you. Thank you so much, Juanita. Um, we do have a few questions from people. Um, the first one is from, from Irene, and she's asking, what is a PA system? Is it an announcement system through which the community can broadcast news? Or did you mount some sort of speaker on a car or vehicle? Yeah, is the second one. So is is the one in which we create a script and then we give the script to somebody that would give the announcement uh, in a car. So they would go around the city or around the town just um, advertising, uh, for example, in this case, the Men's Wellness Day and the Adolescent uh, Wellness Day. Great, thanks. Um, we also have one from Katrina who is asking, she says she's interested in learning about specific case studies of using HCD to design tools used in social and behavior change programs related to gender, violence, and or health seeking norms. Do you have any examples of those, Juanita? Mm, not right now, but probably we can share some of them in Springboard after we have finished uh, this call, if that's okay. okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so another question is, what has been one of your biggest surprises during the prototyping phase? Mm, great question. Um, biggest surprises, I think, um, for the projects I've done has been the openness of people to trying new things. Um, and I wasn't used to it. So many times we face a lot of no's from people, but it has been surprising how open people have been to trying new things, to especially things that they sometimes don't know about. Um, but yeah, seeing this kind of openness to trying new things and to see and learn uh, from prototypes if things can work or they cannot work. Um, the other thing has been uh, how fast paced uh, prototyping and testing can be and how, how fast paced we can make it happen. Uh, sometimes uh, we take around, uh, let's say from the co-design workshop until we have the actual tangible prototype around two to three days. And the actual potential that prototyping has uh, is about that, not spending a lot of time, not spending a lot of money in building something that might not work. Uh, for me, that's that has been also fantastic, in which we many, many times when we are working in the field, we don't have a lot of resources. Uh, for example, printing in beautiful colors or paintings or things like that. But with very basic materials and very basic things, we have been able to create wonderful things that have uh, shown us a lot of uh, results and very fast and quick results. Awesome, thank you. Um, just trying to see if there's any other, oh, one last comment and question um, is that having a beginner's mind is, is much easier said than done, even when people are willing. So do you have any tips for helping people to adopt a beginner's mind? No, I, I would say, I know it's very hard. I know um, that it's not something that you can do from one day to another. And for me, my, my only suggestion would be to understand that it's a process, understand that you, you cannot do it immediately, but that it will take some time. And to look to the problem, probably start by things that are not necessarily professional, but in kind of things that are personal too. Uh, challenges that we face in our daily life, try and challenge yourselves and try to look at your own problems with, with a different lens, with a, prob with a different lens and with a different hat of, yes, this has happened to me before and this is how I usually solve this kind of issue, but perhaps on challenges that are not professional would uh, teach us also how to do uh, these kind of things. That would be my, my suggestion and also another thing would be to also understand that 
holds human-centered design and not only having a beginner's mind, it's a process also to, to have confidence on creativity and a confidence on, yes, I can look at this with a different lens and I can approach it differently. And if I approach it differently, then my result will be different from the things that I have been doing before. So this would be my, my second point too. Thank you. And we do have, it looks like one last question that came in from Noemi. Um, she says, can you give examples of how you might evaluate the impact of your prototypes on the community or health of the target population? For example, the men's wellness day or the growth measurement chart, how do you evaluate whether those prototypes are working? Okay, yeah, great question too. So for uh, each of the prototypes that we decide to, to test, before we test them, we also design a testing plan. So in this testing plan, uh, we also write down or have in mind the kind of variables that we're testing for each of the prototypes that we're testing. For example, in the men's wellness day, one of our variables was the number of men that were coming to the men's wellness day, the kind of service that they were asking for, and also another one would be how they heard about the men's wellness day. So from there, we knew kind of the um, capacity that our health providers would have to attend the number of men that were coming to, to this kind of well, wellness day. And also from the first print that we learned that the posters were not, su not successful, the flyers were not successful. So that was why on the second sprint we decided to focus only for the men's wellness day on the PA and also on the radio spot. So having my suggestion is to have not only a qualitative feedback from all the prototypes that would be for example talking to um, the men that are that went to the men's wellness day so we had an exit interview with around 30 men that went to the men's wellness days and this was a qualitative interview in which we were asking questions such as how did how did you feel in your consultation what would you like um, that has that had been done differently but we also have a quantitative feedback from the prototype. And this is what, I, what we suggest uh, always to have in mind when prototyping, having these two, these two variables. So that the, the kind of feedback that you have from the prototypes is not very soft, but you also have that, those numbers that sometimes help giving you, keep giving a bit of strength to the prototypes. Great, thank you so much, Juanita. Do you have any other final um, thoughts before we wrap up? No, no, it was just fantastic to be to be here. And um, I think we can share the, the presentation later on and also some of the case studies that uh, people were asking about. Uh, but it was my pleasure to be here and hopefully this can happen again. Wonderful, thank you so much Juanita for joining us. And as we mentioned before, um, our HCD experts will be, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> available to answer additional questions online in a written format over the next few days. So thank you very much for joining our HCD Festival and we hope that you've learned some new things. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.